Okay, Happy New Year, everybody. Hi, Silver in here. Uh, just want to wish you a Happy New Year. Good. Fantastic. Hey, Sophie, how you doing? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Silver in here. I want to wish you a wonderful New Year and uh, welcome you to the the late one with Silburn and uh, with my special guest tonight, um, Larissa. Uh, but for now, I just want to thank you for coming on. It's going to be a very interesting year, um, 2018. And why 2018 is going to be an interesting year is because 2017 was the base that we started on, or 2016 was the base that we started on, or 2015 was the base that we started on, or 2014 was the base that we started on, um, whereby we appreciate each part of the growth, you know? Um, so the growth only can be with a base. You had to be somewhere before you go into the new year. And always a person who don't believe so much in the new resolution and the new fad, and a new craziness. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing a new year. I'm going to be this this year. Blah blah blah. When really and truly, two days ago, three four days ago, you weren't much different from what you are today. Um, of course, I'm not putting any sort of that on anything, but I'm just talking about some realities of life. So one of the things that I always specify on, in regards to myself, is that I will just continue to do what I'm doing continue to be what I'm be what I am and try to be the best of the best that I can be but of course there are always times that you want to um, what should I say want to turn over some new leaf and I believe very strongly in what we call um, um, hope and and the hope that we have sometimes um, is sometimes very important because there are certain things that inspire hope and a new leaf, a new time, a new dispensation sometimes create these new new opportunities. <clears throat> now, before I go any further, <clears throat> I want to somewhat <clears throat> pass, give my uh, condolences to uh, Janice Budd. I don't know if you guys know Janice Budd or those who are Jamaicans. Janice Budd is, uh, was uh, a reporter and a journalist in Jamaica. She did some of the news as well. Um, Jenny Spud um, and I went to school, not Westwood High School, but York Castle, um, Brownstone coming to college. And I remember running against Jenny Spud in the, um, what do you call it? The, the vice president elections for Brownstone coming to college. And it was a bit crazy, you know. Um, but these days, what is happening now, you know, it is it is very interesting when the people that you know sometimes that you're close to or that you went to school with, they pass away. And you recognize to a certain extent that uh, anything can happen in life. Um, I'm here today, may not be tomorrow. So in a way, we have got to somewhat live our life to be very meaningful, live our life to be very... Um, um, what should I say, pleasing, live our life whereby we can help one another. And sometimes time waits on no man. And sometimes we've got to be, what should I say, being very proactive. Um, well, one of the things that, um, yeah, so so may Janice Bud rest in peace and um, her family. Um, condolences to them and uh, you know, <clears throat> people who know her very well from high school, whatever, we, we wish you all the best. Um, we, we, we wish the family all the best and our condolences to Janice Bud. Now, I'm just going to go straight into it because um, you've seen the video which you, I may have I done a, a week and a half ago talking about the whole issue of um, sexual abuse by of women, by men, or sexual abuse period of minors. And I said to myself that I'm tired of these things. I'm tired of we getting excited every time something happens or or someone else is um, caught up in the whole thing. And and we, we tend to, what should I say, make all this noise, get all this hoo-ha, 
and we say, oh, we're going to do this. And we say, where are the people are and everything like that. And then, you know, nothing seems to happen. Nothing seems to happen. And we just keep talking about it. We just keep talking about it. And in my video, we say we just keep talking about it. And I mentioned also Moni Duran. Moni Duran, who um, maybe she might be online now because we somewhat um, became friends recently. She reached out. And since I did that video, a lot of people has actually reached out. And and one of the persons that reached out and, and, and linking is Miss Larissa Rizzi Rohn. Hi, Larissa. Hi, Silver. Fantastic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to introduce to you <clears throat> Larissa Rizzi Rohn. And uh, Larissa is going to say more about herself, but just like in the, 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 the bit which I, I sort of put out there, it was very, um, I did a very shorthand version, isn't it, Larissa? <laughs> you <laughs> <Okay>. did. <laughs> Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Larissa is a, a, a mother, a writer, motivational speaker, an advocate about what you should know is that um, Larissa was sexually abused at the age of five by her own family member, her grandmother's husband. Uh, she was repeatedly raped until she was 16 years old. She's also a third generation victim by the same man. Now she's speaking out. And ladies and gentlemen, why, why I said, I said I'm going to use my platform um, as a part of the, the process in somewhat shedding a light and for letting these um, uh, ladies, uh, beautiful ladies who have been abused, being able to speak out and somewhat to create a level of synergy. Uh, because a lot of people have reached out. Monique Duran, um, she's getting lots of people reaching out. And I want to say this before I talk to uh, Larissa. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the Bible, and there's a scripture in it whereby I think it was Elijah, Elijah was saying, there's hardly anyone, I'm the only one. And the Lord sort of opened his eyes and he realized that and said, there's not the only one, there are many out there as well. And he showed him thousands out mm -hmm. there as well. And what is happening is that there's a silence in the world aspect of sexual abuse, child abuse. And what we're having now is Children who are now adults who are now talking out, speaking up as much as possible. But I won't go any further. Larissa, good evening and thank you for joining on the late one with Silver. <laughs> yeah. You're most welcome. Thanks for How having are you today? me. I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Larissa, in a nutshell, <clears throat> tell us about um, you know, I mean you you've I think you've been doing the circuit for a while <laughs> and it's not as if to say that <laughs> don't want you to keep, um, but you know, tell us about your experience the best that you can. Larissa. So, so people can, I know, you're, I know you're saying I've been talking about this for a while and yes, I have, and it's okay. It's okay. If this is how the story is yeah. going to get out and it's going to help others, then I'll keep talking about it. But my story it's literally what happened uh, one night I got left by my grandmother's house. I was five years old. Are you hearing me? I'm, the, I'm hearing, you, hearing you clearly, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I was five years old, and the very first night I went to my grandmother's house uh, because my dad, my parents got stuck in Kingston, and I had to stay over for that one night. And that first night that I was there at five years old, I remember my grandfather my so-called grandfather he's not my biological granddad but my grandfather nonetheless he came in the room on me and he started asking me weird questions as if I know how to kiss if I know how to do all of these things at five to which I told him of course no I don't he asked me if I wanted him to teach me I said no that never stopped him however he started sticking his slimy, disgusting tongue down my throat. And that proceeded with him fondling, you know, touching me inappropriately. To be frank, as frank as I can be, uh, sticking his fingers where they shouldn't be. Then it, he did that until he pleased himself. He ejaculated. And then he told me that I can't say anything to anyone. He started threatening me that if I said anything, he's going to hurt me. He's going to hurt my grandmother. And the whole works. However, the following day, my mom came back. My mom and dad came back. 
And the first thing I did as soon as I got home, I told her what happened. To which my mom pulled my aunties down. She checked me and I remember specifically at five, she checked me to see if he had penetrated. I didn't know then why she did that. But as we go along, you'll find out. And then she pulled my, my panties back up and told me not to say anything to anyone. And this is including my dad. And of course, being five years old, I did not understand what that was all about, but I listened. She's my mom. And I never said anything to anyone. And so that was at five. I never went back there. Or if I went back there, it wasn't, I wasn't alone. I wasn't left alone there. Um, but then my parents migrated. And in defense of my mother, she never left me at my grandmother's house. She left me at my well, at first, a pastor's house, but then my grandmother came and got me from that house and brought me back to my aunt's house, which I ended up having to go to her house. And when I started going back there, of course, it started. A few more, a um, couple of years later, I had to physically go and live with her because my younger brothers, I'm the eldest of six, my younger mm -hmm. siblings were there and they were being abused of course, not sexually, but they were being abused physically and all of that. And being the eldest, I felt like it was my responsibility. I had to go and do what I could to help them. So before moving back into the house, though, he continued. He would touch me every chance he got. He just did all these sick. Anyhow, so when I was 11, though, was when I started, I moved back to the house. And from there on out, he started, he upped the ante. So it went from fondling to now rape. He started raping me from 11 until I was 16 years old. And what happened from there? Again, I never said anything because I was told not to. And unfortunately, even my aunt that I was living with at the time when I was going back and forth to the house, they never really asked, well, not they, she never asked me during the times we were going back and forth, my sister and I, did he ever touch you? So I figured no one cared. No one gifted, gave a damn. So why should I talk about it anymore? Mm -hmm. However, when I was 13 years old, I got the surprise of my life, which still literally haunts me to this day. I was 13. My baby sister is exactly 10 years younger. And I caught this man with my three-year-old sister. That prompted me to speak. So I went and I told them, I told my aunts, they took me to my grand aunt's house. They called my mom. We thought we were going to be moved from the house, which we were. We were moved from the house temporarily and we were split up. My baby sister went back with my aunt. I was asked to go and live with a grand aunt. No one told my grandmother, of course. However, I got to my grand aunt's and what happened? I also have sickle cell anemia and because of the stress of everything, it incited a crisis. My grand aunt got scared, started saying I was going to die on her and she didn't want that. So they sent me back to my grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. So it continued again, um, again, as I said, until I was 16 years old. Now I left, I migrated uh, when I was 17. I was about to turn 17 and I came to the US to join my mom and my dad. All of us did, my siblings and I. And we got here and all throughout the years, this was bothering me so much, the hurt, the pain and all of that, including the fact that I spoke to my mom and my mom never did anything. So it made my mother and my relationship a little bit tricky. I love my mom with all my heart, but I was just hurt. And throughout the years, I kept wanting to talk about it. For example, my very first visit to a gynecologist, the gynecologist, um, on first checking me, she realized something was wrong. And she started was that asking me this. No, was that this was in the US. This was in the US. This was after I had migrated. And so I'm just saying that because there are several times that I tried to speak after that. And they kept telling me no, not to talk about it because my grandmother. So when after I got checked by the doctor, and there is some issues that she found out, and she knew right away that something had happened to me. I, she called my mom from the, the office and she said, um, we need to make a report. This was years ago when I was in my early 20s. And my mom said, still said no, because we were afraid that he was going to harm my grandmother. 
Okay. There's a whole lot of story, but to, to <laughs> fast yeah, yeah. forward to where I started talking about it. I, in 2013, I was sitting home one day and I got a call from my aunt. This particular aunt is also a victim of his, well, a survivor of his. Yes. Right. And she called me and she started to explain to me that I had some other family members that's upset with me and I couldn't understand why. Long and short of the story is I found out then that a couple younger cousins of mine were also abused by this man. Wow. What happened from there, Silburn, is that I slipped into major depression because I honestly believed with all my heart, had I spoken out about this, it would have never happened to them. And so the mm -hmm. guilt from all of it really pained so bad to the point where I just couldn't do it. I felt like I was going to go crazy. I was literally going to go mad. And this is after my years of, trust me, trying to kill myself, doing the whole works. I've, I've gone through all of that. So trust me, when I talk about the trauma and everything I've experienced, your show is just, I, we won't have enough time. But anyhow, yeah. I found out about my younger cousin. Oh, this is part one. And... This is part one. <laughs> <laughs> is part okay, one. so we'll need several parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yes, I found out about my younger cousins and the pain from that, I just decided I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't give a damn if he wanted to kill my grandmother, if he wanted to kill me, whatever he wanted to do at that point, I had just had it. I, I knew something had to be done and I had to do something about it because the guilt was just eating at me. So with my brother's help, we called, um, called some numbers in Jamaica and we found out that there's not, there isn't a limit, uh, a statue of limitation rather. There isn't a statue of limitation in Jamaica. And I flew to Jamaica in 2013 and I pressed charges against him. Mm. And that's, that's what happened. So the story continues from there. But yes, I, I just couldn't do, deal with it anymore. I didn't care. And of course, I was still going to bats with my mom because the shame and all of that, my mom was still living with that and didn't want me to talk about it. The family, you, you mentioned Monique Duran earlier and exactly yeah. what's happening to her now is what I experienced then that I was receiving threats. Everyone was jo just so angry and telling me, oh, I am shaming the family. I'm shaming my grandmother. But as I mentioned earlier, he also did this to my mother. He did, he raped my mother from she was six until she was 16. And it wasn't until my later years, in my adult years, I found this, this information out. And <clears throat> I'm so, sorry. So, so just to clarify, he's your step-grandfather and it was your mother's stepfather. It's my mom's step stepdad, yes. <laughs> yes. And, yes. And so therefore he's been with your mother, your grandmother, since you guys were very small and your mother yes. was very small. Yes. Hence why he's <clears throat> referred to as my granddad, because he's the only grandfather we knew. Yeah. Like, yeah. So um, when I found out about my mom, that really hurted and angered me even more because I thought right. to myself, this happened to you and yet you left us, you know, you and even after she didn't leave us there, as I said earlier. But even after finding about my finding out about my baby sister and all of that. I know she was here and you know how the situation is of being abroad and not being able to come and go as you please. But regardless of the fact, I was angry and it's been a whole lot. And it's gotten to the point now where I can see my mother in a different light and I have forgiven her for what happened, but it took a lot. And I mean a lot meaning my going to therapy, starting my healing process and, and s with speaking out and doing all of this work. But it's not an easy ride. <laughs> it hasn't been mm -hmm. an easy ride. And it still gets challenging because when I, I, this is one thing that I live with till this day. And it's an image that's imprinted in my brain that I can't get out. And mm -hmm. it's the image of this man with my three-year-old sister. My sister is in her 20s now. But I still have that image in my head that I just cannot get out of. And um, 
again, this is what started the process and got me to the place where I started talking. I just got tired of it. I got so sick and tired of it. I was so hurt. I figured something had to be done. And at that point, as I said, it didn't matter to me. Not that I really, I, I didn't really want my grandmother dead, but I just didn't care anymore. And what do you know? After all of that and the years of my being silent for her to protect her, in 2013, when I brought the charges with the, what is it? The, the case, case itself. Yeah. Yes, the court case. It lasted for three and a half years. And for the three and a half years that I was going to court, the woman that I was asked to protect by my mom, my aunts, by everyone, she was coming to court every day. Why? Yeah. Not because of me or her two daughters that were there with me, because my aunt and my mom was a part of the case to begin with. But she was coming in support of her husband. Okay, <clears throat> okay, ladies and ladies and gentlemen, you can also follow um, Larissa's story because you tend to us giving this sort of feedback after the court cases on your YouTube channel, isn't it? For a period of mm -hmm. time, so yes. people can people can get a sort of feedback as to that. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to welcome you to the late one. Um, I've got Larissa Rizirone, um, who is a survivor of um, sexual abuse from very young. I'm not going to say victim. Uh, I'll say survivor. Thank and you. Speak, <laughs> and who's speaking out uh, because one of the things that I recognize is that I'm not going to be any more a party to the discussions and talking about these things and not do anything. So as a man, I'm putting myself out there to be a voice and to see how my platform can be used to somewhat support um, ladies in this, in this situation. And I'm encouraging men as well because so far... Only woman so far has actually reached out wanting to support and wanting to pull together some sort of task force, which I'm thinking about. Only women, not men, and I'm employing men as well. Uh, please, Larry, to continue, yes. <clears throat> and let me just say, to add to what you just said about imploring men yeah. to, to come forward and to, to help, because it will send a bigger message when you have the men out here speaking out on our behalf. And to add to that, there's a lot of men that have also had this experience. And <laughs> we, we will get into that later, but yeah. anyhow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I started uh, the, the court case and we went to court for three and a half years. And then that wrapped in December of 2016. And since then, I have been advocating, I have been speaking, um, well, you know what? We'll get into that later as well, because I know you have another set of questions to ask me. So Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the question I want to ask you now is, um, uh, which is encouraging, the fact that there's no statutory uh, limitation as to bring in person support to our perpetrators. No. We are seeing, <clears throat> we're seeing what is happening now with the Harvey Weinstein case. We're seeing so many persons, big prominent persons, in the States being, um, and in the UK as well. So this is not something, ladies and gentlemen, which is immune to Jamaica only, as we can know that in Westminster now, there's the historical cases which they're trying to get going. I think about four or five judges have been um, um, sort of stepped back from it, but that is something, Larissa, which is not only for, for Jamaica. But one of the things that I want to actually touch on is one of the things that the, the few persons who have reached out to me they're writing books, they're doing videos, and they're actually speaking out. But one thing which they keep saying is this, they're alone in the battle. They are alone, mm. even though they're fighting out, mm -hmm. they're alone. And, and now you are, you are alone when that was happening. But do you feel yes. alone, even though you've got that voice and you're speaking out? Uh, you know, is there a different loneliness there now or what? Do I feel alone now <laughs> as in on my journey? Or yeah. do I feel alone as a survivor? Alone as a survivor on your journey, because as I said, few people have been saying they feel alone even though they are actually now speaking out. They got their books, they got their platform, but somehow they still feel alone like they are the only voice speaking out on these issues. The support is not there from the government, support is not there from people in general. <laughs> Well, uh, personally, I can't say that um, you feel alone in the sense that you're doing this. And as you just said, there isn't a lot of support. But I personally cannot say that now. 
because over the past year, for 2017 that is, I've had garnered a lot of support from a lot of persons. What I do find, however, is that survivors that haven't gotten to this place yet of speaking out, they will message and they yeah. will inbox, they will email, but they <laughs> haven't gotten to this particular place of speaking out publicly about yes. it. And we all know the reasons why, you know, because the shame and the guilt and everything that's still associated with it. Um, but I am in agreement with the fact that other survivors will say that they feel alone in their journey because of the fact that it's just, say, for example, myself, and there's now Monique Duran. Well, I can't say now because Monique <laughs> has been around for a little while. She wrote her book from, I think, 2015 or 2016. I know of Julie Mansfield. She's also been doing this work for a while. But the yes. thing that I'm finding is that we're so far few and in between that yes. it's hard. So it's just over the past year that I have met Julie and I knew about Julie before, but I literally met her for the first time last year. And I have been speaking with Monique. So I'm saying all of that now to say, now that we know of each other and there's other persons, other survivors that even on the island of Jamaica <laughs> that have been doing this, but because we didn't know about each other and everyone's yeah. trying to do their work by themselves. And of course, childhood sexual abuse is such a taboo topic that regardless of you have this many persons that have the experience, the truth of the matter is people still don't want to be associated with it. Take, for example, the video that you, you shared on your page, which thank you, by the way. No problem, yes. I, I have family members that I'm in your corner. I'm with you in this. And, they haven't shared the video. They, ha they still haven't shared the video. And I can't, I can't knock them for it. But these are the things that you have to contend with, that you'll have people behind you say, yes, we're in full support and go ahead and do what you're doing and we have your back. But when it comes down to it, you literally feel alone because they're not standing with you. They're not going to publicly say mm -hmm. much because they still don't want to be associated with it because the stigma is still there about the shame yeah. and the shame that's brought on the family. But I'm at the place now where I don't care anymore. First of all, it's not my shame to begin with, you know, and that mm -hmm. is one of the things that I strongly push. And it's the motto for journey to free is that reassign the shame and speak mm -hmm. Because I never asked this man to touch me or any of the persons that try to touch me before and after him. You understand? Yeah. So it's not my shame to carry. And I cannot carry my family secret anymore after I found out that there were so many other persons that were affected by this man. And we're not just talking, not that, I'm not going to say that being fondled is any less than being raped because the trauma is still the same. The hurt is still the same, mm -hmm. but being raped and being raped by someone that you're supposed to love and trust. And this person is supposed to support you and look out for you. It carries a different weight. It really does carry a different weight, a different pain that goes along with that. So, and I, I just know, <laughs> I know for a fact that that's, that's what the problem is, why we feel alone, but if only we could get to the place where we start bonding together and really doing something about this situation as survivors, because yes. you do have, as I, as you mentioned before, you do have the Sissoka and you have other agencies in Jamaica. And let me say this, let me put this disclaimer out. I am talking about Jamaica. We're talking about Jamaica because yes. we're Jamaicans. Focus but of Jamaica. course, this particular situation, childhood sexual abuse, it knows no color, no creed. It, it has no barriers as to who and what family is affected. It, it's yes. just right across. It's all over the world. It's in every single co um, country affecting every person of every color. So we're just speaking about Jamaica because, again, we're Jamaicans, right? So um, the point I was making before is that if we should bond together as survivors and try to get the voices out and to let these people know that we've had enough, and these people, I mean the rapists, the abusers, the pedophiles and perpetrators, no longer 
enough is enough because this is what I know without the shadow of a doubt. When you remain silent, a pedophile never stop. They don't stop. So it happened mm. to me and unbeknownst to me then as a child that it had happened to my mother, but my not speaking and not doing anything, it yes. happened to my sister, it happened to my cousins. And then since I started speaking, then I found out that there's a whole host of cousins that this one particular man um, so molested. <clears throat> yeah. So therefore, there's a third generation, mm -hmm. yes, by mm -hmm. the perpetrator in this case. And if one of the generation had actually spoke out, you would not be a victim. Your little sister First also of would all, not be a victim. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, there's several things at play here, one of which I don't know what is wrong with the mentality of the women from before. That's a whole other topic we need to explore. Yeah, um, sure, another, sure. another topic we need to explore is why is it that there's so many men that believe it's okay to abuse a child sexually? But as you mentioned, I'm third generation. First point, had my grandmother not seen it okay to still marry the man that raped her, mm -hmm. my mother would not have been raped by her husband. Had my mm -hmm. mother had the courage then to speak out, I would not have been raped by him. So that is the three generations right there. And had I spoken out, well, the fact is, let me take that back, because I did speak out. But my mom, unfortunately, because of all the trauma that she had suffered, she, yeah. she just wasn't in a place to help me. And she was still protecting her mother. And that is what I kept yeah. hearing throughout my life. And that created so much hurt and pain for me because I kept wondering, why am I not important enough? Why is everyone choosing this woman over me and over yeah. my sister and over everyone? So it angers you. But the truth of the matter is, had my mother not gone through what she had gone through and had she spoken out about it, and done something about it then, it wouldn't have happened to me. And this is the cycle that keeps giving when we remain silent because we're still talking about, oh, it's shameful. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just too much. It's too much. I just, I just, want, to, I just want to ask this question. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for joining. And uh, uh, by Santa Faulkner, Wool Reforms, Sophia, Adrian Dawkins, Natalie, um, thank you so much. Please um, do share this video because uh, I don't want to use this video and this discussion um, as to discussing private issues. It's about life-changing issues we're talking about here. Uh, so please take this moment and just press share, invite someone to watch mm -hmm. this. Um, Larissa, someone mentioned yeah. that all survivors aren't extroverts. So many may not mm -hmm. wish to speak out, but still support. Now, would you say you're an extrovert? <laughs> Not by any means, not by any means. And if anyone knows me and they'll know that much, doing all of this, if I had a choice, well, I do have a choice, but circumstances brought me to this place. But I would prefer to not be out in the forefront in doing this. No, mm. because I don't like the camera light being in the forefront. It, it's not something that I've, I've ever wanted to do or say I, I want to be no I grew up sheltered and I grew up of course with so many self um self-esteem issues and all of that so and putting yourself out there and speaking about this it's not easy because you open yourself up to all sorts of judgment and criticism and you know people judging you wrongfully making up their own uh, or having their own beliefs as to the reasons why you're doing what you're doing so it's not an easy path. And I know everyone is not an extrovert. I'm not. But it just got to the place where this particular person just got so sick of it. I got really tired of it. And one of the reasons that I am doing this, honestly, it's not just because I got sick of what he did, but it's my doing, going out and doing the campaigns now and meeting with children and having a little seven-year-old girl standing up 
in the middle of a presentation I'm giving and asking me questions like, what if you tell mommy and daddy and they tell you you have to keep your mouth shut because the manna make you eat? Things yes. like that. You don't have a choice anymore to, to speak or you can't just sit back anymore because you realize what is really happening and the trauma that is being inflicted on the children. So and I'm not, listen, I... I'm, I would never sit here and tell everybody or, or all survivors we need to come out. And when I say to speak, I don't mean you have to do what I am doing. Yes, I am saying yes. find someone to speak to because what you find is what has been happening recently. I just released this video uh, the 31st or the 1st. I don't remember, but just a few Good days ago. Yeah. And there has been an, influx of messages and everything that's coming my way of survivors and literally yeah. everyone is pretty much telling me they're not they haven't spoken about it because it's either when they first spoke about it they got shut down by family members or whomever or they just never spoke because the abuser and when i say the abuser i don't mean just men because a lot of persons and a lot of stories i'm hearing now they were abused by women you and understand you know, about it, the bot? Yeah, and, and it's, very it's very interesting because <clears throat> Monique reached out to me today and uh, and and I'm going to get Monique on the show at some time. And uh, one of the things that Monique spoke about was the fact that, and this was very profound what she said. <clears throat> this was very profound. Mm -hmm. What she said is that everybody in Jamaica, every family, know of an uncle or a pedophile in their family the uncle who you like to touch up, you look as nieces or yes. whatever like that. Yes. Do you, do you take that same position as well? I do. And again, it's not just in Jamaica, but it's pretty much now that I have been doing this. <clears throat> and it's not just in Jamaica. It's here because I speak here in the U.S. as well. I have groups that yes. I meet with. And it's the one story that's being replayed over and over. Oh, my God. If it's not them the person you're talking to that it happened to, I know someone. So it's, it, they're there. And for example, the community that I'm from in York, St. well, I'm not from there, but where I was living with my grandmother and her husband, in that community, there were loads of older men because I have a phobia. <laughs> I have a phobia of old men now, I swear. There, but there were loads of old men in that community that for some reason they felt the need to just come up and they touch you inappropriately. We're talking about Monique. I heard so many made a post today about how many times have you had to dodge and you had to bob and weave to get away from persons that's trying to touch you inappropriately. I've had that experience, not just with my grandmother's husband, but I've had older men in the community to the point where I started thinking, is it something that I have on my forehead that they can do or they feel the need to come and touch me? Or is it that they're congregating? Because a lot of these men, this man was also friends with. And they would just come up and who's trying to stick their hands up under my shirt? Who's trying to stick their nasty, grimy tongue down my mouth? And I honestly believe for the vast majority, they knew they're doing it to their family members or they're doing it to other girls or little boys mm -hmm. in the community. They yeah. knew about it. They just would not speak on it. And this is where the change needs to come from because we've been silent for so long that it progressed and it got to this place now where almost every single solitary family that you come in contact with have a story to share that, oh my God, I have a cousin, my sister, that happened to my sister, that happened to my mother, that happened to my grandmother, for God's sake. Wow. So it's just um, it's too much. So we're at a cross I believe we're at a crossroad now. Would you, would you, do you think this is a crossroad or you think it's gonna be another nine day wonder? <sighs> so Burn, I hope to God it's not a nine day wonder. On my part, the, the talking about it is one thing. I can't, I, I, I'm, I can't say what another person is going to do. But for myself, I am just done with all the chatting. I am done. Something needs to be done. We need to have some initiatives going in addition to all the others that have already started. 
But what I would love to see is for survivors to bond together and start blowing the roof off of this thing. Because this is the only way that we're really going to incite any kind of change. I call it's it, good. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, call, I call it who's going to build the cat. <laughs> well, hey, hey. Who is going to build the cat? Um, because I, I said to a few persons, um, because, you know, I run this organization facilities for Better Jamaica. And sometimes we come up with something or there's something which is going on in the society. And we say, okay, let's deal with this. And people say, yes, 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 yes. And when you reach out to individuals to say, okay, what will you do? Well, I'm busy, blah, blah, blah. And yes. I, that's, why I, that's why I use this term recently. We've got to get our hands dirty. And not, not in the sense of being literally, but in a figurative sense, whereby yes. we all play a part in the process. So my part in playing with the process is doing this, is somewhat becoming a, a conduit, if anything, whereby people can actually, we, we can create something. This is, what I, this is what I want to do. We can create this hub whereby yourselves, the Moniques, or whatever, can somewhat be part. Huh? Uh, right. No, I'm saying I'm just calling a couple names of other yes, women and, that uh, I yeah, know I'm are other names. Yes, yeah. and yeah. and I've got some other names of persons who have reached out as well. Not privileged to share their names as yet, but to somewhat have this sort of task force or something like mm -hmm. that, and to first start that task force, whereby then you reach out to Jamaica. But I find it difficult at this moment to reach out to Jamaica in the sense of saying, let's start bringing all these organizations. Because I said, if I start to think about it and say, hang on a second. If you want to start to work with these organizations who have been there for years, then something is wrong there, really, to a certain extent. You know? and, and, and that's where I'm actually struggling with when, I, when I'm hearing what is happening. Mark you, mm -hmm. it is important to utilize what is already there already. So I, I, I believe that what what is it Cisco 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 Sisoka Sisoka so the child advocate all different persons actually yes. I believe what may happen is that the organizations and the government may be shamed into creating action the pedophiles need to be actually locked up the pedophiles need to be um, exposed. If there is a sex register, let it be a sex register, not a silent mm -hmm. register or so. They need to be safe houses whereby oh. if you if you, as you as you said, many people don't want to speak out because if they speak out, they're gonna be ostracized. They're gonna be financially yes. destitute. Where can they go? What is the preventative measures by the, the system? Um, if I ask you this question and you can I don't know if you can share it, but what was the outcome of your uh, judicial process? I mean, it's up to you with your grandfather. Was there, you know, if you, whatever you want, I don't know. Okay, want so how much time do we have now? <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. the outcome of that court case was that he ended up getting a suspended sentence and also 12 Is that, months. Does that, mean castr does that mean castration? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it means he gets to go home and sing la di da. But um, he, in addition to the, the two-year suspended sentence, he also received uh, 12 months that he has to report to a parole officer. Now, let me add, because I know this is probably going to anger some folks or whatever, but believe it or not, I did ask for leniency for this man after he pleaded. And wow. my reason, yes, there, my, I had my reasonings behind that. However, I know I angered a lot of even family members when I did that. First of all, I didn't, when my asking for leniency, I didn't know, of course, he was going <coughs> to be granted a suspended sentence. I thought more or less he would get some time. But for me personally, I did not wish to see this man spend the rest of his years in prison. And this is the reason why. He had no remorse, just like my grandmother. They have no remorse of what happened because this person has said to me over and over, he's even said it to my sister and my sister and myself face that we're lucky. We never breed. We never breed. We and we never boss we up. And during mm -hmm. the court proceedings, 
he was literally there and he was just there there were things that happened so boring that we don't have time to get into so i realized mm-hmm. him being spending the rest of his life in prison would not yes he would probably die in prison i don't think he would even he would probably wouldn't even last a year so i ended up asking for leniency that they would cut the time yes for him because i wanted him to be available to see me get to this place and to whether you believe it or not my doing this my speaking out my with every interview that i do every every article that he reads he is squirming he's sitting there bawling all oh, for god's sake why i won't stop why am i doing this why am i doing this so for yeah. me him spending the rest of his years in prison wasn't going to do a damn thing it wasn't going to do anything for me and that is specific to my case i am not saying this is just on the judicial system this is not um what is going to happen in every case of persons going forward this is just for me and i would advocate and i would suggest if you can as survivors and you want to go ahead and seek justice bring their behinds to court and prayfully they get what they deserve but for me seeing my grandmother's husband well i wouldn't have seen him physically but to know that he's behind bars eating taxpayers money and sitting there literally just dwindling his thumbs and he doesn't know he can't see this he can't be shitting bullets mm. that wasn't going to work for me it it wasn't going to work for me and these are the reasons as to why i ended up asking yes he should have done some time he should have but it didn't go that way and that's because there were other factors at play as well because he's 80 something years old yeah. now and um he had a lot of health issues going on for um one of the reasons um he's partially deaf and there was oh my gosh we'll we'll get into that at a later date but the mm-hmm. during the trial there was just a lot of things that were going on you know they kept coming with all the different um illnesses that were just come they're pulling out of the thin air that he had but he did have and still do have some health issues um so a lot of those things were taken <coughs> into consideration i believe by the court system and the fact that he was a first time offender so all of these things taken into consideration and the fact that i did ask for leniency for him uh that's i guess how he ended up getting a two year suspended sentence and what that means is literally that he's home for two years and for that additional year that he reports to a parole officer yeah. but as i heard the judge say to him if his name comes before the court at any point especially within those two years and well three years technically he'll be sent up the river and he he wouldn't mm-hmm. see the light of day but um yeah that's ended up that's what ended up happening in my case so uh so would you say then was there any level of forgiveness then from your side um <laughs> uh that that uh, forgiveness let me see how do i want to respond to that mm-hmm. I on this journey of my my journey to free one of the things that I have been struggling with it's that part of it the forgiving part and forgiving him I can't honestly say I have gotten there just yet what I had to do however there was a lot of forgiving forgiving myself was the most important thing I had to learn how to forgive myself how I had to let go of all the broken hopes and dreams that i had or all the hurt that i carried of never feeling important and that my own mom again before i even knew what had happened to her that my mom never chose me and my aunts didn't protect me they never saw me as more important as a child than their yes. mother you know so all of that hurt and pain i have had to release but where my grandmother's husband is concerned and more so even her his wife now my grandmother i still mm-hmm. struggle with that part now because as i said when you've been asked for years to protect and to shield this woman and this woman is coming to court every day in 
support of the man that you were yeah. asked your entire life to protect. And in addition to that, my grandmother has said things like, what is the big deal about that happening is just a little F and the word ends with K. So mm. things of that, this is why I'm saying they have absolutely no remorse. It's, it's as if I, I can't explain or can't go into words what's mm. going on in my grandmother's head. I won't even try. However, mm. it's, it's to the place now where I have to get to that place where I just release them all together. But mm. it's a process. As you know, healing is a process. It's not a destination. Yes. So getting to the place where I can say I truly forgive him uh, or I have forgiven him 100%. I am not 100% there. But what I can say is that where I was before, I am no longer there. I am wow. not that bitter and that angry and literally want to see him and slit his throat anymore. I'm not at that place anymore. So I know I've come a long way. I don't know if I don't even know if that means I've forgiven him, mm. but it's a process. I'm working at it. <laughs> well, well, uh, a, a few persons are saying uh, a chance of Stacy said, "I used to have a chopper next to my kitchen when I cook. A man to use to, when I when I when I cook. A man used to put his hands through the window. I almost chop off his hand, and from that day he was scared of me." Um, Ingrid Nugent said, "Freedom is coming." Um, Chan is uh, Nadine Double C. You're special. You can read these later when you're when you off. Um, I will. Uh, Ingrid, Ingrid Nugent said, You have to forgive or you won't be free. Um, when he's clear, he said, You will never be free in himself. And But this is what Ingrid Nugent said, which is very powerful. He wasn't a first time offender. But I guess for the uh, purpose of the. Yeah, go on. So, so could I add? Say? Ingrid Nugent. Hi. Ingrid Nugent has been one of the most significant person in my journey or my starting my journey. Um, no, she, uh, regardless of what others may think, she's a cousin. She's my cousin, actually. This is my biological cousin. And um, Ingrid also is one of those persons that's speaking out. He wasn't her abuser, but she's also been sexually abused as a child. And she's mm -hmm. another survivor that's been speaking out and advocating. Um, but Ingrid has played such a major role in supporting and having my back. Because in the initial stage, as I mentioned earlier, what Monique is going through right now, I've gone through the same exact thing with family members. I still to this day, quite a few of my family members still don't talk to me as a result of my speaking. But Ingrid was that one person that regardless, we were in different countries, but regardless, she kept saying, you know what, go ahead, baby, you have this, you got this, I have your back, even all the way from Canada. <laughs> and she was so supportive. And going through the process and have gotten to where she is now is there's a couple of persons that I look up to and as survivors that have started this process and they're ahead of me in the healing process and the forgiving stages. Yes, but yes. Um, Ingrid would be one of them. Julie Mansfield would be the other. These women are women that I totally adore and I look to as survivors and I, I pull from them. I pull strength from them because they're great. And... Believe it or not, my mother. Yes. I pull from my mother's strength because one of these fine days, you may have to interview my mother. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ingrid is just saying, she just clarified, uh, my dad was my abuser and two neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 before I go on to what are some of the things you're doing, because I really want to go on to what you're doing um, yes. as, as to sort of alleviate some of these and to help other persons because you've got a couple of projects on which I want people to know so they can support you. And it's very important that okay. people support. But what about that psychological issue? The, do, what are some of the um, help from a psychological perspective that you may have had that people who have been abused need to have at the same time? Um, for me, psychologically, the thing that helped me, I had to start therapy. I went into therapy over the years. It's something I shied away from because my father, <laughs> God rest his soul, 
um, used to tell me only mad people, only mad people got therapy and all of that. So it's something that, of course, the stigma associated with that yeah, as, taboo well. To that as well. Yes, yes. It, it's taboo. Exactly. Yeah. So I shied away from that. But literally, it was either that or I was I would be in prison now because when I found out about my younger cousins and what started happening to me then, I needed an outlet. And so I had to find someone's couch, well, a chair, and I had to start talking. In addition to that, that's how my blog Journey to Free began. Narrative therapy is another form of therapy. You know, um, there are other outlets in which people and, and different people use, because I know of a, a survivor currently um, in Jamaica that her platform is her, through her singing, her songs. She writes songs. She's an artist. And um, there's different ways for you to get to that place. But right. for me, it started with the therapy and my blogging. I used to write, actually, I started writing from a very early age because even from I was at my grandmother's house, I stumbled into that because I had to find an outlet to cope. And so that's how I did it. But it got to the place where that wasn't enough. I, I couldn't write anymore. I, I started my book years ago and it was still sitting on my, my, t my night table for years yeah. because I just couldn't get myself to go to those very ugly places but thanks be to god and this is how i know things happen in sequence and it happens mm. for a reason because um when i found out about these two beautiful beautiful girls that i'm related to and what started happening there i had to find a therapist and start there but yeah. also with what i'm doing now so that's my form of therapy and that's what helps me psychologically Wow. Well, wow, that's, that's awesome. So, so, so tell us now, what are some of the, the projects? You mentioned Journey to Free. That is the, your, your book. No, my book. <laughs> my book is in the works. It's not. Okay. Uh, you are book, yeah. <laughs> um, Journey to Free. <laughs> Journey to Free dot com. Journey to Free is a blog that I started back in 2013. But I had to stop writing because, of course, with the the court case and everything, uh, we couldn't have conflict of interest. So I had to stop. But I started again back in, when was it, late 2016 and 2017. I started blogging again. But yeah. so I have journeytofree.com um, where people can reach out to me there. But your question is, what am I doing now? Yes. Because I've gotten to the place now, Silburn, where I am through talking and I am trying to do as much as I possibly can. As a result of all of this, um, in my experience, I am putting together now a, a awakened retreat. And what this is, is that to take a few girls from the parishes and to take them to a location away from home, away from community, and to bring some psychologists in, some clinical psychologists, psychologists of all sorts, just to get these girls on the process, on the journey rather, of, to their healing. So I am doing that currently. In addition to that, I have a baby drive. First of all, let me talk about that. Yes. You mentioned earlier my work with the Sissoka. And I, I came to that, I got to that place because I started a campaign called the Good Touch, Bad Touch campaign. And this is where we go into the schools and we talk with the children. And this is schools ranging from basic schools to high school. And yes. um, we go into the schools. The Sissoka in St. Thomas accompanies me. And because this is a part of their mandate, you know, the Sissoka, they have to go into the schools and talk. But what I've been doing and what I found is that when you have a survivor standing there and speaking with them, it yeah. sheds, it, it gives it a whole new meaning because it's different when you have persons talking at and talking to someone that have never yeah. had the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, versus yeah. as someone that has the experience. So I've been doing that where we go into the schools and we talk about, you know, teaching children that they have rights too and the, the difference between a good touch and a bad touch. So my doing that 
and being affiliated with the Sissoka and other agencies in St. Thomas. I've been privy to certain information. Yeah. Something that I found out that is currently happening is that there are currently t over 26 girls in St. Thomas, Jamaica, that is currently pregnant by their abusers. And these girls range from the age of 12 through 15 and a half. Wow. And they're all pregnant. And they have no way, no how, no, no means, rather, of caring for themselves or for the children that they're about to give birth to. So I started this baby drive where I am collecting items from just about any and everybody that's willing to donate. In addition to the baby drive, I have a pregnancy kit drive going because another thing I found out from the Sissoka, one of the things that happens is when a, a child comes in to make a report, they have to take them, after giving the report, they have to take them to the hospitals. And yeah. from the hospitals, they have, they, it's mandatory, they have to do a pregnancy test. Now, majority of the children that are coming in, their parents cannot even afford the pregnancy test. And that's 200 Jamaican dollars. 200 wow. Jamaican dollars, and they can't afford it. So you have police officers from the Sissoka that's having to dip into their pockets and to help these, these families out. So I started also that, that drive where I'm trying to, as best as I possibly can. And these are things that I have also bought out of my, my, my own pocket, yeah. trying to can, can assist we, these families. Can we stop there? <clears throat> so, the, so the baby drive, yes? Yes. Yeah, let's see, focus on the baby drive. How can people support your, you on the baby drive? Journeytofree.com. Just reach sure. out to me. There, there is a PayPal account there for persons that's in close proximity and persons that's in Jamaica that want to donate actual gifts and kinds. Just let me know if they're in close proximity. I've gone and I've picked up stuff and um, we're getting ready to do a shipment to Jamaica now. In addition to that, um, persons that's on the grounds in Jamaica and want to donate, uh, reach out to me and I'll let you know exactly how to get the things to them. So ladies and, we, so ladies and gentlemen, um, do um, journeytofree.com. We're going to put that in the body of the this link after that, um, uh, Larissa, so people can actually um, get that information. So okay. we've got journeytofree.com journey to with the baby drive. So that is one of the project as well to support uh, young mothers. But with these yes. young mothers, can I just ask a question? Mm -hmm. they, are, they are victims or impregnated by their family members. Is it or is it could be from anyone or what? No, no. A lot of them are impregnated from their family members. About yes. of the 26, about two of them were from outside. But again, these were by grown men. They're impregnated by, yeah. So, um, but for the vast majority, it's by family members. Are they and still a lot, in that uh, Unfortunately, a few of these girls are still at the homes. In the homes. That, that, that too, it's a home. So born, we don't have time. <laughs> mm -hmm. We don't have time. We'll be here for days talking yeah, about this. Yes, a few yes. of these girls still have to go back to the homes after this is reported. And what you're finding too is that a lot of these girls are at the mercies of some of these perps because they don't have the ways and the means. And then the mothers basically are telling them, oh, well, you know, you have to do what you have to do because. But isn't there something wrong if you've got children who are under 15, 12, who are pregnant, don't the police know about these and then they can follow the, <laughs> I was going to say something, follow the thing, <laughs> follow to see how that happened there. Are you there, Monique? No, uh, so I'm calling, Larissa, are you there? Let me see if I can get back, Larissa, one second. Was going to bring back Larissa on. Um, don't know what happened there. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, you have you have you have been listening um, as to Larissa uh, 
outcome and what she's talking about. I'm going to try to get her back on. I'm just mindful of time as well. <clears throat> I'm just want to touch base on a couple of the things that she's doing, a couple of the projects that she's doing, and with those product projects as to how um, we can actually support as much as possible. And um, and as you can see, this is a, a serious issue, really. And we've got to applaud um, Larissa on the work that she's doing. Um, she mentioned journeytofree.com. Journeytofree.com is her website where people can actually support what she's doing. Um, <clears throat> you've seen the, the the blog that she does. You've also seen the, the uh, she's in the process of writing a book. She's also doing the, the, little, the, the baby drive, the baby drive, which is actually um, very important and very crucial as well. Um, as she said, okay, let me see if I can get her back on. Um, as, as she said, it is, um, ah, we're back. We I am so sorry about that. <laughs> what ended yeah. up happening, I just received a call from Jamaica. So it cut, Okay. Are oh, oh, they saying you shouldn't be on? Are oh, they saying you shouldn't be online? Funny enough, that's why I was trying. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know what the call is about, but uh, that was, that's what happens when you're doing a live, right? <laughs> okay. okay. What, what I want to do, I want to wrap up actually is um, just these couple of things is just the, the support that you need because we'll have to do this another time and uh, we'll yes. be, be over an hour now. Um, so we talk about a baby to baby drive, yes? Mm -hmm. And and persons can reach out to journey to uh, journey, journey to. and that's journey the number two, not two, two yes. T O, but the number two. Yes, right. journey okay. two we, free. We, we put that 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 down there so people can actually uh, tap into that as well and to give you the support. What else? What's the other project that you're doing? If I didn't okay, so let me see if I can get through this. So we spoke about the retreat that we'll be doing yeah, this you. summer. That, uh, I definitely need a lot of support on that because um, it's, as you can imagine, it's very costly to do that. So we have the retreat going, we have the baby drive, um, and oh, I'm in the process of working with the St. Francis Hospital here in, um, St. Francis Hospital is in Hartford, Connecticut, and we're looking into doing a medical mission as well going to Jamaica, um, of course. Okay. Yes. So we're trying to, we're trying to organize that to figure out the dynamics of all of that and put that together. Um, I've been doing a lot of workshops, conferences, doing all those th things, good stuff. If anyone wants to reach out to me, they can reach out to me and, and ask about all of that. But most importantly, journey to free myself, we're, getting ready to launch a series called Mask. And Mask is simply about getting survivors that want to tell their story, but they're still afraid. They're still wearing the mask of the shame and the hurt and the pain to tell their stories. But what we're getting ready to do is to have them literally wear a mask. So no one can tell who it is. Their voices, their fa if they're not wearing a, a mask per se, their voices and their faces will be distorted. So no one can really tell who they are because yeah. I strongly believe that we have to get persons talking about the trauma that they're living with. And what is the mask that they wear? For example, for me, there's so many masks that I wore over the years, you know, acting as if everything is fine and everything is perfect when I was literally dying on the, side, on the inside and wanting to kill myself. And had there mm -hmm. been a, a platform or an avenue or somebody just asking me, hey, mm -hmm. is everything okay? You know, but I never had that. So I'm trying to create this platform now to have survivors. And this is, not, again... It's not just for Jamaicans. It's for anyone and everyone, be it man or woman, that wants to yeah. tell their story, but haven't gotten to this place where they can be on mask and be talking about their stories publicly. You just want to share and to talk about all the, the things that you have experienced and how being sexually abused as a child has manifested in your life. 
For example, you're not trusting your, your levels of broken relationships, whether it's personal relationships, it, just right across the board. How has it manifested in your life? And so we can get the ball rolling and getting people to understand that the, the traumas that's associated with this knows no end. So we have to do something. And if we can get survivors out and sharing their stories and so everyone can understand that we've just had enough and people are hurting <clears throat> and we have to get to the bottom of this, then that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're getting ready to launch. So I want people, persons listening to your show, persons any and everywhere, you're a survivor and you want to share your story. You want to talk. Let us know what happened to you, how it affected you, what is the mask that you're currently wearing. Please reach out to me. I am on, I, I believe, all the social media platforms at this point. My personal uh, Facebook page is Larissa Rizzi Roan. Mm -hmm. I am on Facebook. I have um, a YouTube channel of the same name. Just Google Journey to Free. Yeah. And again, it's the number two. But please, let's, let's be about this. And I have survivors share their story. And so the world will really get to know what is really going on in our lives and why we're so messed up as a society. Because people are hurting mm -hmm. and no one's talking. Well, I can't say no one because a lot of persons are yeah. talking, but it pales in comparison to those that aren't. You know, you know what, what, I, what I would love to see my dream um, and my dream is that uh, the last time when we were talking about something like this, I think it was a maybe the Moravian pastor in Jamaica who was oh. with that little girl or maybe yes. with some other persons or maybe with some other persons or maybe with that other one in 2012. Oh. I had this vision, really, uh, a situation whereby you mentioned this medical team going to Jamaica, yes? Yes. Um, that medical team is what type of specialty are you talking about? It varies. Um, not just uh, doctors of medicine, but also clinical psychologists. And um, it's, not, it's bringing in um, psychologists from here, but also bonding with those, trying to create, um, sorry, relationships and, and get persons on board there in Jamaica so everyone can come together and do this. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I'm glad you said that because I'm in the legal field here. I'm a child care lawyer. I do everything with child care specialists and everything like Sweet. that. I, I, I do a lot of stuff with social workers. Um, and I spoke to a few social workers sometimes. And they always say they'd love to go to Jamaica and do some stuff there. Uh, oh. I believe what would, be so, what would be great is, firstly, if there can be safe houses in the 14 parishes of Jamaica. <laughs> safe houses whereby once they speak up, there's somewhere they can go to. As someone said a while ago, if they speak up, what is the support mechanism? So we mm -hmm. need a support mechanism, I believe, that's safe house, yes. um, which is also going to be a safe house and not a pray house because <laughs> P-R-E-Y house. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was the and. And an, Ananda or some place where some young girls were kept and they realized they were actually sexing them off still or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. A lot of these the, homes are not safe. They they really aren't. Exactly. Because you have the exactly. predators going into the homes for that reason. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So you got the safe house, which is a safe house, another prey house, P-R-E-Y. And also it should be a prey house, one which is prayerful, of course. Mm -hmm. But then also I'd love to see social workers, um, clinical psychologists and those persons going to Jamaica maybe for a month, like a massive holiday thing mm -hmm. to bring out persons who are actually traumatized. But it got to be that safe house. It got to be also the police, the, the government, I, I believe, has got to play a fundamental <sighs> role in actually locking up these persons. So therefore, that 200 pound or whatever to get the pregnancy test, <clears throat> they can do the process of elimination and find out who is a perpetrator, who is a rapist, who is a pedophile? Because <laughs> as I was speaking some time ago with another friend is that we never knew the word pedophile in Jamaica. We never thought it was anything for a bigger man to sleep with a younger girl. We just thought it was just girls yeah. like bigger yeah. men. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that we thought of as bad. So therefore, the education factor again as well, Larissa. That is, so therefore, you know, just like how they have the 
Vision 2030. I think something like this will have to have maybe a 10 year, 20 year plan and start the process in order to eradicate or for people to be somewhat um, educated young boys um, as much as possible. Um, so I, I'm really happy about what you're saying there. Um, yeah, keep speaking. Let me just add that that is one of my biggest dreams right now. It's a future goal. It's a future dream, but it's one of my biggest dreams because for St. Thomas, Jamaica, especially St. Thomas, Jamaica is one of the worst hit parishes in Jamaica. And I don't, I, there isn't a safe <coughs> home. I think there is one somewhere that's closer to Kingston. But of course, it's overcrowded. It's not being funded properly. So it, it's when you talk about homes, it's almost, it's null and void. Because even if they are homes, they're just not being run properly. And one of my ultimate dreams is to start a home there. And as you mentioned, a proper home where children mm -hmm. are not being preyed on. And I say children because this is not just for girls. It's also for or young <coughs> boys because boys are being raped and being sexually abused almost as often and as frequently as the girls. So we have to talk about that as well. But something that you mentioned earlier Oh my gosh, I just lost my chain of thought. Um, you were talking police. about uh, the, <laughs> the police. We can try to get everyone on board, but here's the problem we're having in Jamaica specifically. People are so afraid of talking because the pedophiles, the rapists, the perpetrator, pe perpetrators, they're everywhere. You know, from politicians to the police to teachers, not to mention the church. So it's literally people are afraid of talking because it's everywhere they turn, they don't feel safe. And then added to the fact that the threats that people often, not just the perps, but other persons in the community will say, oh, if you talk, what we're going to do, because this particular, whether it's a gang member or whomever, is mm -hmm. supplying and, and it's, it's feeding folks. So there's so many things that we have to touch on and we have to figure out what the solutions are. We know that Jamaica is a third world country and majority of the persons there are very poor. And I do yeah. strongly believe that this is a part of the reason where mothers, for example, are condoning what is happening to their daughters. Some of them are putting these mm -hmm. girls out for those reasons. So there, right across the board, there's so many things that we have to look into. You, you mentioned earlier as well, someone, probably a viewer, had stated what happens when they come forth and they speak. That is one of the things that I have been personally working on, along with, I know Julie is doing it as well. We're trying to find out ways, different means of projects, for example, how we can literally set set a team up together where we can find counselors, you know, clinical counselors, whomever to, to send these people to, because going in, talking to persons, riling them up and then possibly getting back on a plane and going okay. home and leaving them in it. No, I don't want to do that either. So we need exactly. to figure out that's something that I personally am looking into. But again, in St. Thomas, Jamaica, I found out there is one counselor, that comes in all the way from Kingston and whether it's a he or she comes in every Thursday and they're there for a few hours and then they're, they're gone. Explain to me, how is it that one counselor is going to actually counsel the entire population of St. Thomas? It's not possible. So it's all of these factors that we have to look into, but people are in dire need. They're in they're in dire need of help and people are hurting so born. Yes, so yes, something yes. has to give, something has to give. Like well, the government along with survivors, yeah. we all have to put our heads together and find out what it is that we need to start doing. Well, well, well I think, I think um, if we start to chronicle or chronicalize, if that's there was at the list, some of these initiatives, um, I believe it's a start. I believe mean, mm. the start whereby the uh, the diaspora as well. Well, I'm in the diaspora. Yes. I'm in the UK. Will have to play a fundamental role. 
but I'm not so much of an advocate of as many <laughs> people as suggesting into sort of engaging with the government to start the process. I believe in starting the process, starting the process now with what is in your hands. I always yes. have this thing when I started my talk show um, with this red chair and everything that I believe the Lord said to me, what is in your hands? And I believe sometimes we have got to take advantage of what we have in our hands. Right now we have in our hands the social media, we have in our hands persons who have been um, abused, who are not survivors, they are coming out. So what we need to do is fuse together, um, as I said, said using this, this platform as a, a tool Yes. I'm saying that with what you're doing, with what Monique is doing, with other names that you have said, the persons, is to form a task force. And I'm saying to people here who are listening, if you're serious or whatever, contact um, Larissa, inbox myself. I've got lots of inboxes as well um, as to what people want to do. But I say, and I kid you not, you have to get your hands in the plow it's not just about, it's, it's okay, not enough okay. to just be sitting on the sideline <laughs> chatting yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those days done because guess it's what done. i've got a daughter i've got a daughter i've got a son and they're young and many people have children the last thing you want to know is that you're only going to speak out when something happens to your child when it happens to you exactly to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all have a part to play you know and um Laurie, so we could go on forever, um, <laughs> but I want, I want to, uh, and this is just the start of something. This is just the start of something because um, um, I don't know. I like the, I like the thing. Who's going to bell the cat? Uh, I don't know. I, I think I might create something called who's going to bell the cat and hey. uh, belling the cat. Who, who is going to start the process? And I, it's not going to be a you or a me. It's going to be we. Uh, we. The people it has to be interested. us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be an us factor. It's going to bell the cat. So, uh, Melissa Dye, Ingrid Nugent, Venice Clary, all the persons who have been here and listening, it would be good to say Al Simpson, I'm calling some names, Bevan Malcolm, um, Dale oh. Willis, um, guys, um, my good mate who is a teacher at St. Hilda's High School, um, you know, you know, you know, let's get on board, man. Um, but my last, <laughs> but, but the last word, um, I, I'm going to leave the last word with you, um, Larissa. Okay. Um, what I would like to say, just to wrap this up, is more than anything else, what I would <clears throat> like, the message I want to send to survivors of childhood sexual abuse and the children that are currently going through this, please know this was not your fault. This was not your fault. Someone preying on you, taking advantage of you, doing things to you that you never asked for. It could have never been your fault. It will <clears throat> never be your fault. These are persons that are older. They should know better. They should have done better in protecting us, but they didn't. So do not allow yourself to stay in that place where you're blaming yourself or thinking that you had anything, any, any part to play in someone doing this to you. Let's get to the point where we start the healing process for the survivors. We need to speak out in hopes of saving the younger ones, the generation before me, it's kind of hopeless <laughs> because they've made so many excuses and justifications as to why it's okay so i am pleading with my generation and the generations to come the younger generations please let's do something about this let's start as you said belling the cat let's start doing yeah. something bell pick the up the like ball bell, bell the cat, the cat. Yeah. we have to bell do something if we have any hopes of saving our children and making this world a better place we have to do something. And it's not enough for those of you, especially, and this is something that irks me, it gets, it, it pains me to my heart because you have persons in community and in the very families that know the trauma that these children are going through and currently experiencing. And when they start acting up, you know, you have these same people that saying, oh, the pit and them just bad and they're this and they're that. When mm -hmm. the girls and boys are acting promis promiscuous, there are reasons behind it. Think about what you're saying before you open your mouths and you say things. Children don't come out acting a particular way. Something is going on. So if you see a little girl that was perfectly fine prior, start acting funny and she, she's all of a sudden 
her interest. It's just about boys and men. And think about it. I'm not saying that all little girls are like that or little boys, but the mm -hmm. vast majority, something happened. Someone has been touching them inappropriately and they have to act up on it because now the urges are there. They don't know what to do, what with, and there's no one helping them. So for God's sakes, wow. let's start supporting her children and parents, especially you mothers, for the love of God. When your daughters and your sons come home and tell you that someone touched them inappropriately, choose your child. For God's sake, stand up. I do understand the fear factor, but believe me when I tell you, as much as the issues manifest in children as well as in childhood, but this is when it really starts happening in the adult years, when you cannot have a proper relationship, you cannot trust anyone, you cannot take a compliment. And I throw that back at you, Silburn, for saying that to me today, <laughs> because of the psychological traumas that you've gone through in childhood that plays out in your adult years. So God, please. And trust me, again, I know I know it's only the grace of God that has gotten me to the place where I can literally sit and I can talk to you. Is it easy to still sit here, even though I've been doing this and tell the world that I was abused by my grandmother's husband? No. Is it easy to tell people, to let people into the most intricate details of your life, your most personal life, to say, I was abused, my mother was abused, my sister was abused? No, because you still have these idiots that are going to say things like, oh, you didn't want it and, and things of that nature. So it's mm -hmm. not easy, but it has to be done if we have any hopes of saving our children and having persons that are running around that's actually more whole than being broken. This is the only way we can do this. We have to start talking. Yeah. We have to start yeah. grabbing the bull by the horn and doing something and that's pretty much it. I, I could go on, as you said, for hours. We'll be yes. up for days. <laughs> so. Well, 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 well. It says in the profile that you're a motivational speaker, and um, yes. but the level of motivational is is motivating people out of the bondage, out of the fear, out of the loneliness, and into freedom. So yes. it is a it's a wonderful work you're doing, and I have to encourage it. And you know, you got Thank our you. support from here. And, thank um, you, you thank know, you. we pray the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and give you peace and, um, and you. you stay blessed. Um, this is just a start of something and, um, I'm planning to have money gone very soon yes. and, um, other mm -hmm. persons as well to, to maintain the momentum. And then at some point, I hope everybody will meet and see how we are progressing on to save the children of the world. Because, listen, Laurie, so what is happening now is not just that. Society is sexualizing children. I did a, a video the other day about how the, so many agendas now are trying to mess around with children. Yes. Their sexuality, the whole yes. transgender movement. Boys are boys, girls, girls become girls. Girl. I mean, it's all crazy. Yes. Children are so messed up. Yes. Not, no, children are not messed up, but they're trying to mess no. up children. Yes. So yes, therefore, we've got, you see... God has entrusted us with children and we have a duty to protect the children. And if we do not protect the children, I believe the wrath of God is going to put up our hands. And I, I, say to people all, I say to people all the while, I know society is changing, but the world hasn't changed. It is the people in it has changed. Yes. God hasn't changed. And my, my philosophy and my view is that this is how I was brought up. This is what I believe. So I'm not going to change because somebody don't know about their sexuality and trying to push that on other people. That's what is happening. That's what is it. Somebody doesn't know their sexuality, whether they are male or female, and because they reach a position of prominence, they're trying to mess up children with the education. Anyhow, I'm just divulging right there because it's a massive work. This is just a part of the whole process. And I'm sure you got your views on that. But uh, but I want to thank you so much, um, Larissa. And um, all the best. But what I will ask you to do is look at through some of the comments. And if you can put I in will. your details and your contact, or people are asking for your contact and your details as well. And okay. just speak to some of the persons there. 
and um, have that interaction as well, as much as possible. All right? Okay, I will, I will. I'd like to let me just add just that. Um, for on journeytofree.com, yes. for persons that are in, interested in donating, there's a PayPal account there, a link. So if they want to donate, they can go there. Um, but I definitely will go on after we're done here and I will go through the comments and I will post my links there. But thank you, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all the viewers that took time to sit and actually listen. And as you said, yeah. let's get the ball, let's do something. Enough chatting. I'm, an, I'm all talked out. Action. Let's build the cat. Action. Let's build the cat. Let's build the cat. I like that. Yes. I I like that. I think that's what I'm going to name it. What is it? Let's bell the cat. Who's oh, so going to bell the cat? We're belling the cat and journeying to free? Okay. We're belling the cat. <laughs> yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yes. Good night. All of us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. And um, I hope you enjoyed that with um, Larissa, um, with Zeron. And, um, and it's great. I believe that um, this is an opportunity that we can be a part of something. As I said, I'm just creating a platform and want to be a part of a solution. It's important to be a part of a solution as much as possible. And so I encourage everybody. And if you want to follow me, you can go to my YouTube channel, silburntv.com. Uh, I've got a, a Facebook page, which is always over the limit. Um, people trying to add me all the while. I've got to remove some person. But I also have got a, a, a like page, which is over 6,300. You can actually follow me there. And also I've got an over. I've got a, what do you call it, an extra Facebook page, Silburn SBC deal as well. Because um, I'm on a journey. And, and um, I'm not playing around. I'm not skinning teeth as much as possible. I'm not um, jiving on this particular issue. And guess what? I think I might have Miss Liz Roach, Lisa Roach, maybe tomorrow night or maybe tomorrow night, Lisa Roach um, on the show. Lisa Roach is the lady who went to JoJo's. I don't know if you guys know about JoJo in, King, in Kingston, uh, a Chinese restaurant. And she was told, it is said, that's what she said, go back where you come from. <laughs> the Chinese told her to go back to where she come from. And she's got a massive story there. Uh, with another person named Candice and how they were sort of um, bullied out of that place. Can you imagine in Jamaica, uh, you're told by a Chinese, go back where you come from um, as a Jamaican. That's very interesting. But also what is important, she also has an organization which is talk about being proud to be black. And I found that very strange for in Jamaica to have an organization called Being Proud to be Black when 85% of the persons in Jamaica is black. That's something I must say. But I'm going to actually have her on. And we're going to talk about that. It's about identity. And yes, so, but I'll be keeping an eye on this particular issue in regards to the abuse of children. And, you know, Fitzroy Daily mentioned silver, and there are aspects to it. You've got the incest aspect, but you've got also the other issue with young girls and big men, you know, which is another one as well. And the other issue whereby people and parents somewhat pimping out their children in the sense of, not turning a blind eye where their children is with um, older men because they bring in the money. These are taboo subjects, taboo subjects that we all know. There are many open secrets in Jamaica, ladies and gentlemen. We all know them, but we're going to expose them. And what I said to Monique, and, and Monique brought it up today when she mentioned me in her video, <clears throat> she said, I said, if we don't start to deal with this issue, names are going to be called. And Monica started where names are going to be called. People are just going to get fed up and start calling names. And, you know, I'm not going to stop anybody from calling names because guess what? The cat has got to be belled. Who is going to bell the cat? And on that note, I want to say thank you so much for joining me on The Late One with Silburn. And um, see you around and have a good night. And I will always say this. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and may he give you peace. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Over and Thank you.